It's 4 p.m. here in Singapore. We are connecting you live from DBS Asia Central Spark Studio. I'm Femi Ray, DBS Chief Economist at Group Research. I am here with me, my colleagues, Philip Wee, Senior FX Strategist, and Eugene Liao, Senior Rate Strategist. Three of us today will spend the next one hour talking to you about the rather dramatic month we have had in the world of rates and FX, as well as uh, the various developments that have sort of made us rethink our economic forecasts. Um, but we will turn things around a bit this time. Typically, I start with a macro discussion, followed by one of my colleagues. But today, given how critical the rates-related development have been over the past month or so, between the debt ceiling in the US and various forthcoming market distortionary issues like the US Treasury issuance uh, in, in a subseismic manner, uh, we thought that we would start with Eugene with the rates picture, followed by Philip with the FX picture, and I will come in toward the last third of the discussions with uh, 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 exposition on the economic outlook. Um, Eugene, why don't you hit the first slide? I want to show and share with our colleagues the QR code for the Q&A session. Right, so as you can see, uh, both options, there's a QR code on the screen, and there's also the URL, dbs.pigeonhole.at, and there is the passcode for that, you can punch in. Uh, so use either option, and we'll keep this information on the screen repeatedly, so that you don't have to struggle between the screen that you're watching us and some other screen where you have to do the QR code. Uh, but do send us questions. I will be monitoring through the whole discussion. And after that, we will uh, take them on, uh, at least for the last 10 minutes or so. So with that in mind, uh, Eugene, all yours. Thank you very much, Taima. So, so like Taima mentioned, right, the last one to two months have been particularly dramatic for interest rates. And uh, this is the framework that I have in terms of analyzing how interest rates go, where the risks tilt. And there have been substantial shifts over the past uh, three, four weeks or so. So I think the foremost would be financial stability. I think that's the first pillar of any kind of financial system. And when faced with a threat such as a banking crisis uh, that might be imminent, similar to what we saw in March when, when a series of US banks failed, uh, the top priority would be to cool off the hawkishness, right? And then once that is achieved, uh, we can go on to the stated objectives of the Fed that would be stable prices and full employment, right? That, broadly speaking, that translates into inflation close to around 2% and growth again close to uh, around 2%. So this set of priorities have become a lot more important over the last two, three weeks. And on the third point, uh, we still have to keep in mind that uh, we are probably in a different regime that, uh, from what we are used to. Uh, the post-GFC environment was characterized by very, very low interest rates, a lot of negative yielding debt, but we think that has changed. And uh, this is a theme that we have brought up over the past two years. So keeping this in mind, uh, we should address two of the big issues that markets have been very uncomfortable with uh, for the past two months. So the first point would be the banking sector. Right? So if you have one bank failing, followed by another and another, it doesn't give a lot of uh, confidence. So we, we can split up and monitor the amount of stresses in the banking sector by looking at uh, the loans that they're giving, as well as the deposits that they have. Right? And we can also split it up into the large banks, which are supposed to be safer, as well as the smaller banks, which are perceived to be more risky. So what you notice is that there had been a lot of outflows, deposit outflows, as well as uh, CNI loans from the smaller banks in March. But if you look at the more recent few weeks, that has stabilized, right? So this can come through a few ways. Some of the Fed policies appear to be, uh, liquidity policies appear to be working. And it seems that uh, currently uh, the, the US economy seems to be firm enough uh, such that further contagion onto other banks is not occurring. But for the larger banks, it seems that things have been broadly stable. So the takeaway from the last few weeks of stability is that a banking crisis does not appear imminent. So this is a very big change from the acute fears that we saw in March. So 
What about overall financial stresses, right? Banking sector feeds into financial system stresses. If you look at where we are now, despite how high interest rates have went, again, financial conditions, which take into account many, many different market variables, uh, including credit spreads uh, and performance in the stock market, volatility, etc. These do not yet show the same level of stresses that we saw in the second half of last year when the Fed was very aggressively hiking rates. So again, it feels like given where we are in terms of monetary policy, the market is able to handle it so far. And if you look at the data that we've seen so far on the labor market front, it seems that the real economy is still doing relatively okay. Right, so financial conditions are not yet a problem. Um, what about the other aspect of stress? Right, so the first stress on banking sector uh, seems to have dissipated for now. What about the debt ceiling? So debt too dissipated over the past week. So for the past four or five months, there's been this lingering concerns that if, if this debt ceiling issue, uh, if it's not lifted, uh, then the US might have trouble repaying this debt. Right, so, so now that it's clear, we should split things into the pre-deal as well as the post-deal uh, kind of environment. So in the pre-deal environment, because of the debt cap, the net issuances that the Treasury can issue is, is capped, right? So net issuances are effectively zero. Uh, in terms of liquidity, well, the TGA, which is the money that the, Fed ha uh, that the government has, has been run down close to zero. Right, because think of it as your savings account, and, and if there's not enough revenue, it slowly draws down. And as these this funds get out into the financial system, there's more liquidity washing around. So the third point would be collateral. I think there might be some concerns about uh, very short-dated T-bills, and they, there's some worries that there are some counterparties that are not keen to accept these as collateral. And the last point is an economic overhang, where because of this uncertainty, uh, it, it could uh, impact on the global, global economy, the US economy, and how, how it will perform. So this kind of overhang, this kind of issues have largely dissipated, and we are shifting into the post-deal environment. So in terms of issuances, there will be a surge, right? because the Treasury Secretary Yellen has been running extraordinary measures for quite a few months, so that there are some bills that need to be paid. So there will be a surge in bill issuances, probably around one trillion over the next, uh, say, six to eight weeks or so. Uh, in terms of the net impact, uh, they might want to rebuild their cash balances up to, say, 450 to 500 billion. So it is the net impact that, that matters because if you issue out a trillion and then you give out 500 billion, then the debt impact on liquidity is 500. Right? So in terms of liquidity, it will get a little bit tighter because these bill issuances will soak in uh, the funds that are available outside uh, to the private sector. In terms of collateral, uh, I think supply goes back to normal. And the event risk, right? This is positive for sentiment because this, this overhang is, is gone. So what we've got to gauge is whether there's meaningful fiscal tightening. And looking at the deal that got struck, uh, it seems to be more of a spending uh, freeze, uh, excluding defense. And uh, it doesn't seem to be that contractionary. So if you look at the liquidity point of view and where the dollars are at now, the red line represents what the treasury has and that amount has fallen close to zero and it has to be rebuilt up to say around 450, 500 levels with some buffer. Now the other two aspects would be in terms of bank deposits, that's the grey line as well as the money market funds. Right? So, so, so these are where people also store their short term money. Right? So if the Fed net issues about 500, where will the money come from? So this is uh, quite important because that, that determines whether there will be funding stresses in the system or not. So if a lot of the money comes from the money market funds or the Fed's RRP facility, uh, then it wouldn't be that bad. But if it comes from bank reserves, then there could be some stresses that might appear. 
So if you look at bank reserves, we have estimates of how much uh, are excesses, and we also stack that together with the Fed's reverse repo uh, facility just to show that in terms of total dollar excess liquidity that is available out there, uh, we still have a lot of money. The question is one of distributions. Are they sitting with the banks, with the money market funds, with the Fed? Right? So, so in terms of banks, excess reserves are still significant. If they take a 500 billion hit from there, it's going to be a bit painful, but still not quite the end of the world. Uh, we suspect it would be a pretty good mix between bank reserves, RRP, money market funds. Everybody, depending on which sector they are from, will probably want to take, take a nibble at some of the T-bills that are yielding uh, elevated levels right now. So what about the labour market? Right? So I've talked so much about stresses, event risks, and we've cleared those two. Right, so, so those two are pretty big hurdles because if those two are not clear, it's quite difficult for the Fed to stay hawkish. But no, now that those two events are cleared, we focus on the data, which is the second pillar of what uh, I've been talking about in terms of Fed thinking. Right, so that would be unemployment and payrolls. So payrolls last Friday was incredible, in excess of 300k uh, jobs created. Uh, so for this year, the amount of jobs created uh, is pretty remarkable. Under a more stable, full employment uh, kind of uh, period, we would expect payrolls to be closer to 200k per month. But we are now running way in excess of that. So what gives? Right? And then when we look at, compare that with the unemployment rate, we're hovering at 3.7%. Right? It is an uptick. Uh, but note that these are different surveys and they capture slightly different things. Uh, I think the easiest way to think about it is that in terms of labour market momentum, it is still very, very firm. Right? The jobs are created. The unemployment rate is low, but arguably might not be quite as low as what the official figure is stating. Because if we really are so close to full employment, it is very doubtful that the US will be able to generate in excess of 300k jobs per month. Uh, if you compare an additional indicator, and then there are many other indicators to look at, the number of job vacancies rebounded, so uh, there's still quite a few jobs for, for every unemployed person. So the upshot to this labour market issue is that it's still very, very resilient. Uh, but thankfully, on the CPI front, uh, we'll get another reading uh, next week, but it does seem as if CPI is heading in the right direction, heading down. So in, in terms of what the Fed should do, uh, we got to toggle between these two things, right? So the most important is event risks are gone, focusing on the macro. CPI is coming off, that's good, but the labour market is showing no material signs of weakening, right? So, so in terms of thinking about the higher terminal rate, uh, that has become plausible. So in the dot plot, uh, even if, if they pause next week, they, they could well signal another one or two to go, right? So for, for optionality, they almost certainly have to do it, even if uh, the CPI figures uh, turn out to be much softer than expected. So the summary is that we have done 500 uh, bips of hikes. Uh, the bulk of it is probably behind us. Uh, we think that the Fed will hold through this year and cut in the 2024. Uh, but there are some upside risk to our terminal rates forecast because of how resilient the labour market has been. And we think that a lot of the downside risks on the banking sector as well as debt ceiling have been lifted. So where are rates doing? So in terms of Fed pricing chain changes, again, very extreme. We went from pricing in close to four cuts this year from current levels to barely pricing in half a cut. And we're even looking at potentially one hike or two hikes more to go. So very extreme, very volatile views shift and uh, they tend to be quite binary. So now risk again tilted to the upside. Uh, what about for 10 year yields? So very similar. Uh, it didn't fall quite as remarkably as two-year yields, uh, but under non-stress conditions, we think that the range is probably in the 3.5 to 4 percent range. Uh, the takeaways for me, um, the key point are that event risks have receded. Banking crisis risks uh, could come back, but judging from how the market is doing, uh, it doesn't seem to be an imminent uh, risk. Uh, 
the debt ceiling issue appears to be resolved. And we go back to looking at data, and data is thus far quite firm, especially on the labor market front. We'll be looking for uh, CPI to soften further next week. Uh, there's some upside risk to our terminal rate, rate forecast of 5.25% 5, 5 because the data so far has been resilient. Uh, in terms of rates pricing, we think that they are well out of the banking crisis zone and we are flipping back into the hawkish Fed worries about too tight labour market uh, kind of zone. So with that, uh, I would wrap up uh, my thoughts on this issue. Uh, if you have further questions, uh, please uh, use the pigeonhole uh, uh, to scan and ask further questions. Uh, I would like to invite Philip uh, to continue the discussion on, on FX. Thanks very much, Eugene. Uh, <clears throat> hi. Okay, I'm going to start off um, by sharing um, what how we have arrived you know, to today. Uh, just some background on the evolving landscape. Well, last year was pretty challenging. Um, the dollar went up very strongly uh, in the first, let's say, uh, nine to 10 months before correcting very sharply from November to January. So we had a global slowdown, but you know, central banks were all wrong about transitory inflation and they had to employ aggressive rate hikes every meeting um, to catch up with inflation. Well, this year, uh, things have sort of <clears throat> stabilized. It's become more normal. So, um, you know, uh, markets came in thinking that there's going to be a global recession. As things turn out, uh, it's not that bad. But as we know, <clears throat> it's not that good either. Okay, and on inflation, the good news is that headline inflation has fallen, you know, because of supply side uh, e pressure easing. But core inflation remains sticky. Okay, the good news is that we don't need jumbo hikes anymore. We can go back to the traditional 25 basis hikes. The other thing that is also, I think, becoming more evident is that we don't hike. We don't need to hike at every meeting as well. So you're, you see currencies consolidating, you know, uh, on uh, policy uh, converging or normalizing. Okay, we hope that you know, uh, as we go into next year, economies will emerge from the soft landing. Um, then. Uh, we have real progress towards uh, the target for inflation. And markets are sort of thinking about rate cuts, but central banks will be thinking about keeping real rates positive. And we think that once all the rates, you know, uh, sort of um, no more hikes uh, and growth returns, uh, relative value will continue to favor a higher growth Asia as the developed markets work through all the rate hikes. Okay, on the most, one of the most asked questions uh, this year is uh, the dollar. You know, as we know, the sentiment has been quite weak, but this has been due to the sharp correction that we've seen in November, January. Okay, what I'd like to share today is that ever since the global financial crisis, you know, the dollar index has actually been moving into higher and higher ranges, and we think that we may have formed a new range. Okay, so with regards to the question, about you know, China uh, <clears throat> holding less US bonds. Well, I'd like to highlight one thing. Uh, they have been you know, uh, lessening uh, the purchases uh, ever since President Xi came into power in 2012. And you know, I'd like to draw your attention also to the fact that ever since the US-China trade war started and continuing into the tensions that we have today, uh, you know, the US allies like the UK has been sort of picking up the slack Japan is now the largest holder of uh, U.S. bonds. But if you look on the left, you know, the Fed balance sheet, the big change is that it's now much larger than the foreign holdings. So in a sense, you know, that, um, you know, uh, that back to the question as to why is the U.S. not afraid you know, of China dumping bonds and that you know, the tensions are still continuing uh, to this day. Okay, on the de-dollarization um, question, uh, I'd like to highlight certain things. One is that uh, world trade is still quite small as a percentage of world GDP compared you know, to the size of global stock markets and the size of the global bonds. As you can see, I think from this uh, table, most of the, um, you know, most of the uh, let's say, stock markets and the bond uh, markets, and they're still dominated pretty much by the US and its allies. 
<coughs> and as far as you know, we can tell, you know, um, the dollarization, you know, the dollar's importance uh, in the global system. Yes, you know, uh, it, you know, it's just a process, but I think we can all agree that it's going to take much longer than uh, what has been said out in some circles. Okay, uh, we just had uh, President Biden signing uh, the Financial Responsibility Act over the weekend. So that's how it ended the debt ceiling crisis. So I want to show you, you know, that this current uh, crisis in some ways quite similar uh, to 2011. You know, you've seen, you've heard many comparisons uh, with that period because US lost uh, their triple A uh, debt rating by SMP uh, back then. Because uh, interestingly, I think the experience back in 2011 was that once the <coughs> debt ceiling crisis was resolved, and even with the loss of the uh, debt rating, the dollar actually recovered. So we do need to pay attention uh, to that, you know, to the uh, to Europe because back then it was the eurozone debt crisis that brought the dollar up, or rather, it was you know the euro, the largest DXY component uh, that weakened. So today we have the EU budget being strained by uh, ECB hikes and weak revenue. We've just seen uh, German uh, economy entering into a technical recession, and of course, you know, risk of the Ukraine war, you know, broadening to include uh, NATO. But that is still uh, remains to be seen. Okay, so I talked to you about consolidation, and I thought maybe it's a good idea to, you know, share you uh, the, the currency charts as to how this is playing out. Okay, what I have here is, uh, let's say, dollar yen and dollar Korea. Uh, in 2022 and this year. This year's uh, trading range is uh, shaded. So you can see that, you know, if you look at the shaded compared to last year, things are not as volatile as they had been. Okay, so uh, let's start off with Northeast Asia. The most volatile currencies last year had been the Japanese yen and the Korean one. Okay, so you find that, uh, you know, uh, dollar yen didn't really come down as much as dollar Korea. That's partly because there was a lot of expectations for BOJ to tweak its yield curve control policy. But as it turned out, the new governor you know, turned out to be quite patient uh, you know, in terms of uh, tweaking uh, the policy, especially now that there's a lot of talk about Prime Minister Kishida you know, calling for a snap election. You know, so, but nonetheless, uh, the yen weakness at around 140 has um, seen the Japanese officials uh, warning about intervention again. And we have also seen uh, in Korea, you know, suspected intervention, I think a couple of months ago, that sort of kept dollar Korea around the 1300 level. Okay, in Southeast Asia, uh, we also have, you know, uh, the two most volatile currencies, the ringgit and the Thai baht. Okay, so both has done exceptionally well in terms of the pullback, you know, so um, Malaysia benefited also from uh, stability uh, returning uh, uh, when the <coughs> uh, after the November elections. But going forward, uh, Thailand just had the elections. Um, you know, it was an overwhelming uh, vote. You know, uh, in support of the pro-democracy um, parties. You know, that is sort of had a platform um, that is not so pro, you know, the military or the monarchy. So uh, we still have a few months of uncertainty as to who is going to form the government. At the same time, also with regards to the policy that is going to emerge, you know, so many of the parties uh, have campaigned, you know, on sort of along the populist lines. <coughs> okay, now let's go to Indonesian rupiah and the Philippine peso, where, you know, I'm more inclined to keep my forecast this year alongside the official forecast. Okay, so many of you know that Indonesian rupiah has outperformed. But if you look at the chart here, as you, as you compare with all the other charts I have shown you, you know, um, in reality, the rupiah is simply playing catch up, you know, to the dollar fall uh, that we have seen in all its uh, neighboring partners, as you can compare with the Philippine peso uh, here. Okay, so um, Indonesia, and Philippines, uh, they have paused their hikes. And uh, I think our forecast is, uh, you know, um, is sort of positioning for maybe there'll be a cut, you know, in the second half of this year for Indonesia. Uh, 
But I think the Philippines, uh, they are more conservative and they will probably wait until the market is convinced that inflation is on target towards, not on track towards their target before, you know, they cut the RRR, you know, in the, towards the end of uh, this year. But nonetheless, uh, we do think that uh, there's a good chance, you know, barring any dollar shocks, any, let's say, global economic recession or, let's say, financial crisis, the um, dollar IDR has scope to stay within the 14,800 to 15,200, you know, that's been penciled by the government and peso within the 53 to 57 uh, target as well. Okay, uh, I have been doing quite a bit of talks on Asia's most popular frontier markets. So I've drawn two currencies here, the Indian rupee and the Vietnamese dong. Okay, what's quite interesting is that, you know, both have been quite um, narrow, in very narrow ranges, just at, at different extremes. Okay, India has kept uh, dollar India in the 81 to 83 range. So pretty much everyone's forecast is in around the middle at around 82. Okay, so India has paused, inflation is going back um, to the two to six percent target, you know. So they are quite mindful that Fed high expectation haven't truly uh, disappeared from the market, and you know uh, they are now just inclined to move step by step, uh, you know, uh, towards a more neutral stance in monetary policy. Okay, Vietnamese dong is a bit of a different story. So it has followed uh, most of the dollar Asia lower into a range. Uh, this we forget, you know, Vietnam used to be. Uh, was called a currency manipulator by the U.S. Treasury. So it has an inclination uh, to ensure that, you know, its currency is more or less, I think, as you can see here, in the middle of uh, last year's uh, range. Okay, so Vietnam is also going through uh, quite a bit of challenge. Uh, growth has been disappointing. Uh, they have surprised with rate cuts, 100 basis points, the discount rate in March and 250 basis point, the refi rate in April and May. So uh, we do think that uh, unless, let's say, the dollar comes off, um, they are likely to keep uh, the ranges where they are, you know, um, uh, for the rest of this year. Okay, now let's go to uh, something closer to home, the Singapore dollar and the roaming peak. But I've been tracking these two currencies ever since China DPEC in 2005, and they have been moving uh, on an index basis until, let's say, uh, the past six months. Okay, so what's quite interesting for me is that dollar sing is near the low of last year's range. Dollar China is near the high of last year's range. So at some point, you know, I have to ask this question, how long can this diverge? Of course, you can easily, you know, explain this uh, through Singapore has a very strong uh, sing, po uh, uh, sing policy, okay, which it paused in April, but nonetheless, uh, the signal is still moving quite uh, rapidly at 3% a year. You know, so <clears throat> whereas China, uh, they have surprised with cuts in the RRR, uh, and the economy has been disappointing, uh, not to mention that US China's have sort of intensified and broadened, especially after the uh, spy balloon incident. So, but nonetheless, at some point, uh, it will be interesting uh, to see, you know, uh, when these two currency pairs starts, you know, um, moving back to where they have been uh, in the past. Okay, so to summarize, um, we had extreme volatility last year. So this year we're going to consolidation. Okay, Fed hike expectations, you know, yes, it's lesser, but it's still not gone away. It's still driving volatility uh, in the markets. You know, even within the very tight 101 to 106 range of the dollar index. Okay, so as Eugene mentioned, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, markets is not too convinced that the May hike may be the last of the cycle. So we have to wait for the next FOMC to see if uh, the Fed pencils in a higher Fed funds rate uh, uh, to signal that there may be hikes coming this summer. Okay, so money, but nonetheless, monetary policy is normalizing back to 25 basis hike and no longer at every meeting. Okay, so uh, again, I reiterate, you know, we are looking at some point when most central banks pause and sort of signal that yeah, maybe they're going to keep rates, you know, where they are for some time and markets will need to start moving to relative value. And, you know, I think for 
the longer term, we do think that it will favour Asia because it's as long as it still has a higher growth and a slowing inflation profile. As I outlined risk, as I mentioned, after the debt crisis and based on the 2011 uh, experience, uh, we do need to watch you know, for surprises, especially in Europe, you know, uh, you know, as to whether you know, this dollar can move significantly higher out of its 101 to 106 range. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand my presentation over to Timer. But meanwhile, if you have any questions, okay, so this is our QR code for the pigeonhole again. Okay, if you don't like, you know, the QR code, uh, there's a URL and the passcode, you know, uh, you can enter the passcode uh, on the screen. Thank you. Your timer. Thank you hmm. very much, uh, Philip. So one more time, dbs.pigeonhole.at is the uh, website that you go to, and the passcode is x7x22s. For those of you watching it on LinkedIn, I've actually posted the exact link also in the messages portion, so you can definitely go in there and uh, put your questions in there. I'll be keeping an eye on them. Uh, I'm seeing right now there are about a handful of questions. Uh, we'll, we'll take them on in due course. All right, let's go back to the presentation. Twenty twenty three outlook. The growth outlook for the second quarter of twenty twenty three is actually quite good. And the reason for that is very strong base effect and China's reopening. So taking those two factors, and I'm going to expand on them momentarily, we're looking at a two hundred basis points increased upside as far as growth outturn is concerned for the second quarter of this year. China will likely grow by seven percent. So you have been hearing a lot of discussion on how the ongoing recovery is underwhelming. We share some of that sentiment, but at the same time, we recognize the very strong base effect given how weak demand was and activities were a year ago at this time, that China doesn't have to do a lot of heavy hit lifting to come up with a fairly market pleasing number. So looking at the data that we have for April and some early indications of how May has panned out, including the services PMI that just came out and seemed to suggest that the economy is in decent shape, not decelerating. We think that China's 7% growth outturn, as far as our now casting model is concerned, is a fairly safe one. India, uh, again, pretty favorable base effect from a year ago at this time, and we'll see growth jumped about 6.5%. Indonesia, not a high volatility economy as far as GDP is concerned. A year ago, they were growing at five. They'll grow about the same, more or less, this quarter. Singapore, on the other hand, had a pretty ordinary first quarter. Uh, we do expect a much better number for the second quarter, about 2.2% on a year-on-year -year basis. Singapore, China, India all have rather bleak exports pictures right now. There is a lot of weakness as far as demand for electronics, finished goods, textile, um, household appliances are concerned, but at the same time, uh, it is in the making as far as a trough is concerned, and we do think that the second quarter GDP can still provide fairly pleasing numbers, even if the exports data for the months of May and June were to turn out to be somewhat weak. So this 200 basis points upside, however, as I see in the bullet that you can see on the screen, may mark the high water mark for Asia's GDP growth numbers for this year. By the third quarter, the base effect will catch up. Even if we are surprised on the positive side on a sequential basis, the year-on-year -year growth numbers will be much, much weaker than the sharp rebound numbers that we see in the second quarter. Some of it is actually not quite meaningful. It's just arithmetic bouncing around. But some of it is also important to understand that for the year as a whole, the second quarter growth numbers will not be a marker for what's to come for the rest of the year even if China's recovery turns out to be not too bad, even if the damage from high interest rates turn out to be not too destabilizing. Um, so let's keep that in mind. Base effects will fade, but base effects will fade not just with respect to growth, which will turn adverse and bring it down. It may also have other macro variables that will be impacted by it in the different direction. We'll come to that in a second. But first, 
it's not just the arithmetic and the vagaries of Bayes' effect that we have to deal with. We have a lot more other things going on. Trade certainly is an issue that requires some degree of exposition and understanding. Uh, then there is the property market issue. Uh, geopolitics is omnipresent these days. And while we haven't had any major destabilizing impact of high interest rates, those have been largely concentrated in the US and Europe. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen here. Probably it's just a matter of time. Uh, there is a wall of refinancing for both Asian sovereigns and corporations in the second half of this year and into 2024, whether it is property companies in China or power companies in India, there is a lot of borrowing to be had. Uh, we would need orderly exchange rates, liquidity, interest rates, environment for those refinancing to work out at scale. Uh, Asian economies, particularly India and China, are large. The refunding needs are also large. So you would need uh, an orderly system of dollar liquidity for those systems to function. So we shall keep an eye on it. Uh, I talk with Eugene and others in my team who are on the rate side of the story on a regular basis, and they're telling me that on a day-to-day -day basis, US dollar funding conditions, uh, whether it is from the American investors and borrowers or European and other borrowers' perspective, don't seem to be adverse despite quantitative easing and higher interest rates. So keep our fingers crossed in that area. But the chart that you have on the screen right now is focusing on the trade aspect. When we look at regional PMI surveys, and this is focusing on the manufacturing side, the services pictures are much better. But even on the manufacturing side, when you look at China's PMI, when you look at everybody else in Southeast Asia and North Asia, countries that we cover, as well as a smattering on South Asia, we see PMI in expansionary territory doesn't really uh, coincide or reconcile with the rather uh, bleak trade numbers that we have seen over the past six to nine months. North Asian economies, exporters have basically seen an export recession for more than a year. Southeast Asia has also joined the fray. We have seen some really weak number out of Indonesia lately. India is not that much better either. But despite all that, and despite the fact that exports were contracting by about close to double-digit figures for the entire continent, even a couple of months ago, uh, things look a little better now. Reason for that is, of course, the March and April trade data out of China have been somewhat more favorable. We expect to see that trend to continue when we get the May data in a few days' time. But putting the entire PMI picture together, which is the black line on the screen, and the fact that it has been sort of rising uh, for about you know, six months or so, uh, we are cautiously optimistic that regional exports may also have bottomed out and the worst is probably behind us. Uh, it is interesting that we see a huge amount of excitement around artificial intelligence and the chip ecosystem around that, whether it is NVIDIA or others, uh, have been rallying in the, in the global markets uh, sharply over the last month or so. So surely there is some substantial demand for AI chips and infrastructure around that. Some of those things are designed in the West. Many of those things are manufactured here in Asia. So that could itself be a source of incipient demand. And we also don't think that um, inventories for electronics are large enough to cause multi-year downturn. It will turn, in our view, sooner or later. Given the way Asian PMIs have evolved, maybe sooner. We shall keep an eye on that. We'll see. Um, then there is a whole issue of inflation. As I said earlier, that base effect is not only an aspect of growth. We have favorable base effect pushing up second quarter GDP numbers substantially, which will then be a payback in the second half of the year. The opposite is at play for inflation. We have had a very strong bout of disinflation over the last six months. The chart here tells you why. A year ago at this time, we were in dire straits as far as food security and energy security was concerned. Russia had invaded Ukraine. There was tremendous fear that Europe was looking at the barrel of a terrible recession and a very, very cold winter when many houses would not have uninterrupted supply of heating. Um, those fears have proven to be wrong. Supply side has come to play in a big way, whether it is in the Middle East or the US or elsewhere. We have seen supply of gas, crude oil, et cetera, pick up substantially. We've also been lucky uh, 
it hasn't been a tough year for agriculture. And therefore, despite some questions about wheat supply out of Ukraine and Russia, worldwide food supplies have been orderly. Uh, the fears of mass hunger and food shortages have proven to be uh, just fears, not materialized at all. And thankfully, as a result, uh, we have seen significant disinflation, decline in prices as far as key commodities around the world are concerned. On the screen right now, you're looking at crude oil, soybean, copper, gold, wheat. Um, they all tell a very similar story. The fear factor from a year ago have dissipated entirely. Inflation in many of these things have turned into deflation. Copper is in negative territory or barely flat. Soybean, wheat are definitely in negative territory. Same story for uh, crude oil. The only major commodity that has done somewhat well is oil. Uh, is, sorry, gold, which is up on a, about a one-year basis, but still hovering around $2,000 an ounce. So not at historic highs by any stretch of imagination, but still somewhat better than the other major commodities. So what are they reflecting? They're reflecting weak demand out of China. They're reflecting ample supply for food and energy worldwide. They are not reflecting OPEC or the Russians creating a huge squeeze uh, for commodities, particularly oil. It's also not showing that for electric cars or batteries, there is such a uh, rush for um, rare earth material that inflation in those areas have begun to jump. We're seeing none of those things, not yet. Uh, and the fact that global growth has moderated somewhat in the face of high interest rates in the US perhaps is also having a fairly uh, dampening impact as far as commodity inflation is concerned. So strong base effects are at play there, but uh, improvements, supply side conditions and moderation of demand play a role as well. But then what? What about the second half of 2023 and early 2024 when these base effects fade? So there you have the makings of inflation becoming stickier. Inflation was 8% in the US last year, headline inflation, likely to come down all the way to 4% this year. But then what? When base effects fade, oil stops going down any further, commodity prices have run through all the corrections they could have had, supply is not getting much better, demand, in fact, is beginning to bottom out. Under those circumstances, what would happen to goods inflation? What would happen to services inflation for 2024 and beyond? This is the big question. And we feel that the fixed income market is being a bit too sanguine about that. Uh, in the last six months, the fixed income market has basically been saying recession is just around the corner. The fixed income market has just basically been saying Fed will cut uh, perhaps in the second half of this year, perhaps in the fourth quarter of this year. Now those probabilities are being shifted into, oh, almost certainly there'll be substantial rate cuts in 2024. But what is the basis of this expectation? Two, one, growth is bound to slow. And to revive growth, the Fed would have to cut rates, or inflation is just about over. Medium term and long term expectations around two and a half is going to converge in that direction. I have no doubt that high interest rates would have a negative impact on demand, but I also don't think it would have so much of an impact that the contraction in demand would bring inflation down to two, two and a half percent. There are way too many frictions in the market, it's way too much uncertainty about grid inflation or inflation related to geopolitics or inflation related to uh, deglobalization or new strategies of resiliency. All of those factors point to a world where there is going to be 3% inflation in a good scenario, but 2% seems like a remote scenario to me. Uh, the liquidity, the central bank expectations, the behavior of financial institutions all suggest to years of substantial additional uh, inflation beyond the 2% target that the central banks have made. All right, um, I'm sort of run through the course of my slides and the basic point that I was trying to make there was that we have quite a bit of base effect related dynamic at play. Base effect would mean inflation low now, but perhaps sticky and higher going forward. Base effect also means second quarter significant upside to GDP outturn, that will fade in the second half of the year. So keep an eye on that. Sequential story, underlying demand, all are important, but the markets so many times respond to headline numbers and arithmetic is going to play a large role in both boosting them up and boosting them down 
between now and the second half of this year. All right, I'm going to turn on pigeonhole and start looking at questions. I'm going to invite Eugene and Philip to join me on the screen. And let's see what we've got here. Um, oh, some questions have come up, gentlemen. So I suppose giving those uh, uh, hints was useful. But one more time to those who still have not gotten all their questions in, dbs.pigeonhole.at. So dbs.pigeonhole.at, passcode x7x22s. Go there. And now I will put some questions on the screen. Um, First question sounds like something for Eugene. All right, can we have that on the screen? I'm assuming, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, how high can the Fed go? Yeah, I think it's a trillion dollar question that uh, you have to keep reassessing every few months, right? I think even last year when, when the inflation kicked off, uh, we've been flagging upside risk to inflation for, for one plus two years already. Initially, we thought that the Fed could go perhaps out to 3.5, but, but even when we, when we got there, there was some market volatility, but the economy was still doing okay, and inflation was still very, very high. Then we had to bump it up all the way to 5, 5.25. We've been pretty lazy with that forecast. We haven't touched it for a while. Yeah, yeah, we, we stuck to 5, 5.25 for, for, for quite a while, and it worked. And when the banking crisis hit in uh, March, uh, we thought, oh no, that this could cascade, right? Things, things could happen. And it became binary. Either we lurch into a crisis or, or hey, we'll, we'll be fine after a while. Yeah, so then it becomes uh, okay when, when this imminent risk gets cleared, then perhaps you can go back to fundamentals. And fundamentals does look like the labor market is still very, very firm. So we're going to take it probably slow. Uh, we can go back into a one hike per quarter uh, kind of pace, which which was what the Fed did uh, in the last hike cycle, right, in 2017, 2018. So the uh, days of aggressive Fed hikes are probably behind us, but catching the absolute terminal looks particularly tricky. Right. Yeah. And for the record, we think that the Fed will almost certainly pause in June, but we will have to see the kind of hawkish pause they yeah. do to get a sense of what's going to be in play in July. And I suppose nobody in the Fed even knows the answer to the question yeah. of what's going to happen in July. Depends on a host of data points that will come up between yes. now and the July. We shall see, and we'll keep an eye on that as well. Yeah. All right. The next one is going to be for Philip. And I think Philip gets asked this question every day. Philip, is this a good time to hedge <laughs> US dollar exposure? Well, my simple uh, answer to that is look at the dollar index. Uh, it has been keeping to this 101 to 106 range. Uh, quite nicely. So at this point, uh, we've crossed the halfway mark. We're going towards uh, 1. 0, oh, sorry, 106 uh, because of the renewed Fed high expectations. Um, so the, I think the FOMC uh, uh, a couple of weeks from now will be important. So um, I think our view is that they will probably pause, and but you know they will keep, let's say, the summer heights uh, alive, maybe uh, through the dot plot. So that uh, could you know, keep the dollar firm. Meanwhile, the ECB has also you know, uh, been talking about more hikes, but you know, they've been emphasizing more that the end of their, they're near the end of their tightening cycle. But one thing they have in common is uh, rates are going to be restrictive. So uh, in short, you know, uh, central banks are going to be taking turns. So I'll be looking at level uh, 106 you know, if you need to sell dollars again. But you know, as I emphasized in my presentation, do pay attention to risks uh, that you know something may go wrong in the eurozone, but at this point, uh, I've seen we've seen the banking crisis, we've seen the debt ceiling, you know so far you know they always end up as uh, storms, you know in a teacup. Excellent, mm. thank you, Philip. Okay, mm. this is a terrific and tricky <coughs> question. Um, I think I'm going to take it on, but then I would expect uh, my colleagues to also weigh in. Uh, is it on the screen? Let's see. Yes. Which is a bigger slowdown risk this year, China or the US? It's a hard question to answer. Um, both countries have mitigating factors as well as downside risks materializing. 500 basis points of rate hike, surely that cannot be painless. Surely what we saw in terms of banking system, 
instability in March and April cannot be the final chapter of the impact of high interest rates in the U.S. Uh, so what are we seeing right now, Eugene? We're seeing housing markets sort of topping out. Prices are not growing anymore, but volumes are pretty decent. I think I looked at some inventory data yesterday. Housing inventories have come down, meaning that it's not a bloated market. Supply demand is still on the tighter side. Um, when we look at auto sales, um, not particularly bad, but weakening. Uh, when we look at retail sales, not as strong as last year, but nothing could be, have been as strong as last year given the reopening dynamic, but it's still growing at 0 0.5, 0 0.7 on a monthly basis, not too bad. So I think that um, in my view, the accident in the US or downside to the US economy stems largely from the financial sector. What's your view? I think it's uh, pretty amazing how resilient the US has been right, after 500 basis points of hikes. Uh, I struggle to pinpoint which one is uh, more important uh, because in, term of moment, in terms of momentum, we would have thought China would be doing much better at this point in time. Right, post the reopening, it should have some legs and perhaps tied China through all the way to the end of the year. And then we have a divergence of US slowing and China picking up. But that's not quite been the case. Instead, US has stayed super resilient, uh, whereas China's reopening impetus appears to be fading. And people are more worried about, oh, are there going to be more supportive measures coming in for China? Right. So I think it's, uh, yeah, for me, I think uh, I'm pretty balanced on both. Yeah. Right, right. But look, I mean, if you are going by financial markets, clearly the market's <laughs> verdict is very clear. Market is short China, long US. US equities, after all the doom and gloom, has actually had a pretty decent first half of 2023. And the recent development around AI and generative, uh, you know, different uh, sort of large language models clearly has brought a lot of attention to U.S.'s capacity to innovate, and we're seeing significant value addition and wealth creation, uh, and U.S. consumers refuse to quit. Uh, meanwhile, in the case of China, yes, we all expected reopening-related dynamic to be a source of upside, and we've argued earlier that 7% growth in the second quarter looks good, but clearly it's not as vigorous as we had hoped to be. Uh, my hope and expectation is actually, Eugene, that it sort of becomes more protracted, that travel picks up, but not in a V-shape, but rather stays medium high for several quarters to go. Uh, and we have some colleagues in China who also seem to suggest similar things are happening. Okay, question on RMB. Uh, let's put this on the screen. Yuan has been under pressure in recent weeks with worries over a slowdown in China. What are your thoughts on CNY's direction going forward, Philip? <clears throat> okay. Um Quite happy to say that dollar China is above seven. I mean, we put a seven point oh five forecast, you know, uh, earlier this year, uh, especially after the spy, you know, uh, spy balloon incident. Um, I think the apart from the recovery story, which uh, we felt you know was overhyped, uh, China's you know recovery story is pretty much services driven, um, you know, so uh, didn't really benefit uh, the region. And I think if you look at Vietnam's numbers, and not pertaining to the earlier question you had, uh, I think Vietnam would say that interest rates hurting demand in US and Europe is showing up, mm -hmm. you know, which is why they have eased uh, their monetary policy. And also for the RMB, um, the reason I put it above seven was because that was a level uh, that we breached uh, during the US-China trade war you know, a while back, and we did see a deterioration in the tensions. Know, apart from the disappointment uh, over the recovery. But that said, uh, I think the Chinese officials, uh, they have signaled lately that maybe it's a bit overdone, you know, so, but, you know, but there's still some leg to go, but I wouldn't uh, be uh, what I call keen to put my forecast above 720, you know, the last high at this point in time. Is there any worry in China that a weaker RMB could then feed into financial instability and inflation issues, or not really? Uh, I'm sure you know um, there will be some critics who would think so, but you know. But I always like to remind everyone, uh, China, you know, uh, the domestic RMB uh, capital account is closed, so it don't largely really, closed. yeah, it's largely closed and. And I, you know, I do, you know, I, I actually take my cues from the officials, and you know, as I'm, and I just to reiterate, you know, the latest cue is that, uh, like, Japan, like Korea, you know, they are signaling that the recent dollar run up, you know, may be a tad too much, you know, for the currencies in Northeast Asia. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. 
I think that's a concern, and that will, I think, feed into the next question. It is for Eugene, but Eugene, uh, at one point, maybe even Philip can also weigh in, which is because the FX considerations come in. Is it possible that Asian central banks will cut rates before the Fed? Yeah, I think the question is how much can we decouple from the ultimate risk-free rate, right? I think the answer is uh, not if they can, but would there be consequences that could be right. pretty bad? Exactly. Right? So, so, so it becomes a toggling of different objectives. Uh, I would say that uh, for those economies that are <coughs> typically more stressed when the Fed hikes rate, say, for example, historically, Indonesia or India tend to get some outflows and the Fed rates get very high. But this time around, we don't seem to have that happening, even though the Fed delivered 500 basis points of hikes. Now, there could be some uh, reasoning behind it, very low foreign ownership, uh, still quite resilient domestic markets, and relatively contain inflationary pressures. Right. So in terms of real rates, the rates are still very, very attractive. And for the high yielders, we still have a bit of cushion over the US. Uh, so when there are still some structural plays like made in India, or downstreaming that that's been helping some of these economies. But for the lower yielding ones, it's a bit mixed, right? Because your considerations are, your, your differentials with the US are, are now negative, right? So is there a need to maintain some kind of a positive differential? So I think for the low yielders, it becomes harder to cut before the Fed. But for the high yielders, if conditions are really as benign as they are now, then perhaps they could cut rates towards the end of the year. And by high yielders, you mean Indonesia, Philippines, India? Uh, yes, I think we, we penciled in uh, Indo rate cuts as well uh, by the end of the year. High conviction or low conviction? Well, um, I think moderate. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. I think maybe I can add in. <laughs> sure, please. Yeah, I think generally, um, one thing that I noted is that in Asia, India, Indonesia, they don't have a 2% inflation target, they have a range. And so it's easier for them to go back into target. And I think all central banks, you know, uh, without, let's say, the ongoing on and off again, Fed high expectations, they would love to cut. You know, so this year, uh, the growth, you know, uh, worries are still there. But at the same time, they are, I think, uh, monitoring situation quite closely. So India is only shifting the monetary policy stance, I think, at some point to neutral. Right. Indonesia, yes, we are penciling in a cut. And uh, Philippines has already said that uh, no cuts, but you know, we just think about uh, cutting our, our first by right. the end of the year. Right. Okay. So I think that's mm -hmm. a good point, that mm -hmm. uh, liquidity measures maybe Correct. if yeah. things are tightening a lot, mm -hmm. and things will probably tighten mm -hmm. a lot around uh, quantitative tightening in the US, uh, but it'll take a very brave central banker, in my view, mm -hmm. in Asia to cut rates, be the first one to cut. Um, okay, we have lots of questions left, but very little time. I'm going to put this question up because this issue is kind of close to my heart, so I want to address this if I may. Um, a lot of people think that Asia is shelter from inflation concerns. It's not. If you look at in cumulative inflation from 2020 to today, whether it is India or Singapore or Philippines, it's been 15, 16% inflation over the last three years. This is a lot. It's extreme for Singapore. It is also pretty high for uh, Philippines. And while you may say that India historically is a high inflation economy, it hadn't been re lately. So that's been a shock nonetheless. And these things have tremendous impact on people's well-being, cost of living, and overall sense of economic vitality is sapped when you have such high inflation affecting particularly the poor in the economy. Um, now, inflation could have been higher. Many countries in Asia chose to cut taxes on commodities when commodity prices went up. Some of them did in complete pass-through. Indonesia comes to mind, and, and China is the same story. And therefore, the global movement of commodity prices don't reflect fully on domestic prices, but uh, they have costs. Uh, it can lead to artificial widening of the current account deficit because demand is artificially high, or it could lead to weakness in fiscal revenues because you've been cutting taxes. So there's no free lunch around volatility of globally high commodity prices, and we don't think that prices will come down commensurately because some countries might need to replenish their taxes and their um, uh, various other streams of revenue, uh, dividends and royalties and so on. 
uh, around commodity prices. Um, Eugene, Philip, there were other questions on RBI, et cetera, but I think we've run out of time. So, but I think we did a good job. I think we took a half a dozen or more questions. So thanks for your support, guys. Uh, and thanks to our listeners too, those of you LinkedIn and those of you on WebEx. Uh, we'll come back next month. Never a dull moment in the world of macro. Lots more to talk about. Stay healthy, everybody. Stay well and uh, take care. Goodbye.